Well, welcome back to my channel, Workshop Friend, and uh, this is video number seven on making a homemade lathe, and it's based loosely on my own lathe, which I built a number of years ago and have used um, extensively. Uh, today's topic is going to be about the headstock bearings, and this um, is going to be focusing on the way that I solved. Uh, the problem of making headstock bearings without access to machinery. The only concession was that the the spindle, the, the mandrel, um, was machined by someone else. But the rest of the assembly and the boring, inline boring of the, of the uh, headstock bearings, I undertook myself. So the design I adopted uh, was very much with these limitations in mind. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. Thank you for joining me and as always, uh, if you appreciate the video, do consider giving me a thumbs up and if you'd like to see more such content, then uh, consider subscribing. Okay, this shows the headstock assembly. In fact, this is the picture I used for my workshop friend logo. So it shows there the, the uh, back gear assembly, the, the pulley, st three-step pulley, um, also um, the split bearings in the headstock and uh, two collars, two adjustable collars on this newest bearing, which are used for axial location of the whole assembly. This is the original drawing I produced for the lathe. Um, some, how many, 27 years ago, roughly. And, um, uh, this is just a, a sketch before I had access to uh, CAD and um, um, from this um, uh, some of the parts were produced. Uh, you can see there clearly uh, that they're simple plane bearings. Um, it's just in fact a mild steel uh, mandrel uh, running in cast iron bearings. And this is uh, surprisingly effective. Um, only now after um, uh, more than 25 years of use is it necessary to, um, for me to look into renewing these bearings? So they've lasted quite well. Here's the um, spindle. And um, again, uh, this I have made by someone else by a workshop in town. Um, uh, I just uh, thought that, um, uh, you know, I want to get the machine up and running. So uh, this wasn't um, kind of a purist uh, ideological um, journey for me in which I, I wanted to prove that I could do something it wasn't that for that reason at all I wanted a machine that I could use so um, for me the quickest way of production was was one of the key targets and it made sense for me to get this made as it was I had to wait a long time to get these parts made which did delay things um, and that's why thereafter I was quite keen to minimize the number of parts I had made outside now, I have five examples of headstock bearings which I think will be feasible for um, some to produce in a home workshop. Uh, the first and simplest um, is to have uh, simply bored headstock bearings, which are split on one side with an adjusting screw. And uh, this um, arrangement actually was um, used on the first lathe I had, which was a drum and round bed four inch lathe. And uh, this um, is obviously very cheap, um, um, but it worked. And uh, so that's an arrangement you might consider, especially uh, with steel running in cast iron. Uh, that seems a practical solution. And uh, um, I have heard the only possible downside is that you could split the, the bearing on the opposite side to the, to the split. Um, you could uh, fracture it. So that's that's a slight danger, but uh, that never happened with me. Um, the next arrangement is the arrangement I've adopted on this lathe, on my homemade lathe, and that is uh, split journals. Uh, so um, some way, somewhere in the manufacturing uh, process, you split the, the journal, uh, machine the faces, re, um, remount them and then bore them uh, to size. And um, on the left hand side you can see the location collars to uh, provide axial location and uh, that's the arrangement I have on my lathe. Number three on the list is a refinement on that and that is to um, fit uh, bearing liners 
uh, either in bronze or white metal. Um, uh, there might be other possibilities too. And this uh, is, is a way of uh, maybe increase, increasing the bearing life. Um, and it might actually make fitting easier as well. So that's an alternative. It's a variation on the theme effectively. Number four is a different concept altogether. So here we don't have a split bearing or split journal. Uh, we have um, through board um, uh, journals um, uh, like this. Uh, the left hand one is plain and the right hand one is a tapered bearing. So you can see that the, the lining material, uh, phosphor bronze or uh, white metal is actually tapered. And you can see that the, the headstock bearing has a nice fit in that taper, which is of course adjustable. So by adjusting the axial location of the mandrel, you effectively um, adjust the fit of the right hand bearing, the most important bearing. So to do that, you need to have adjusting collars and um, the left hand adjusting collar, if that's on a thread and is tightened, it's going to draw the mandrel into the tapered bearing, so increase the fit. Uh, but of course, you need, also need a collar on the right hand side to take the thrust load uh, when you're turning. And uh, so that's important. And this is the kind of arrangement I had on my uh, second lathe, which was the um, Spencer Spencer lay that had this kind of arrangement um, uh, though the thrust bearing was slightly different to this but the general layout was uh, the same principle. The next um, possibility is a variation really on the previous and that is instead of having plain bearings um, on the left hand side um, that is to fit uh, uh, ball races. So um, you need uh, two, two ball races um, opposing each other with collars and they need to be adjustable. And um, this is actually the arrangement that's used on the uh, Myford Super 7, uh, which I have in my UK workshop. And uh, you need to fiddle around to adjust those uh, bearings with some preload and to uh, obtain the right um, axial location of the shaft in the tapered bearing on the right hand side. A little bit fiddly, but it works. Now it's important to understand how uh, these bearings work. Um, they're deep groove bearings and um, uh, in order for them to work properly, they need some preload and uh, that ensures that the load goes through the bearing as shown in this diagram here and uh, in a diagonal fashion, fashion from um, the inner track to on one side to the outer track on the other side and the bearing actually runs um, sort of uh, at that in that angular plane and that, that's important to understand so I've seen a number of uh, projects online uh, where folk have uh, just slapped uh, bearings into into an assembly um, uh, with no preload and I'm not really sure how successful that's going to be so you do need some proper arrangement and you need to think about this a little bit um, I haven't gone the whole hog and, and discussed uh, tapered roller bearings. Um, I think that's probably beyond most of us to fit in, in the home workshop, but that's definitely a possibility. And that will come into play on the right hand side there to replace the tapered plain journal. So here you can see another view of the boring process. The, um, the boring bar is supported on the right hand side by a homemade angle plate. Uh, which is clamped to the bed. You can also see there the saddle temporarily removed on the right hand side. And uh, so this process um, worked very well. And together with the, um, the core prints left in the casting so that I had holes ready made uh, for the headstock bearings um, meant that this really wasn't an arduous process. It, it was really quite straightforward. This is a boring bar. Unfortunately, I cut it up for something else, but it gives you an idea of the arrangement with the pillar blocks. Um, but there was one challenge and that was um, the vertical um, faces, the facing of the, of the left hand bearing. 
And of course, that's necessary for the two collars. And um, this was a little bit of a challenge. So I had to make a special tool for this. Uh, this is a little tool. You can see that um, uh, it was actually handmade. It uh, basically consists of a um, high speed steel tool bit which sits um, in a little holder which can slide um, along that way and it's pushed along with a screw which is actually missing on the right hand side. So there's the tool bit and it basically moves up and down um, that track um, not very far, just sufficient to cut the, uh, the radius uh, required. Um, you'll see in the next view how it's assembled. That bottom piece actually comes up and uh, sits here and it sandwiches the boring bar which you've just seen. So in operation, it looks like this and it sits on the boring bar and it rotates like that. And so what I would do is um, advance um, the cut um, by, by moving the radial location of the, of the cutting tip there and take a facing cut and then do that repeatedly. And that was to cut through the, uh, the skin on the cast iron and to give me a reasonably flat surface. So it sounds very crude, um, but that's the way that I did it and it, it worked. So here you can see the mandrel on the, on the bench with the bull gear and the three-step pulley and the gear which is attached to the three-step pulley which drives the back gear. And then just above that, you can see this split collar. Now the idea of the split collar design um, was that I didn't have to thread the mandrel and um, to, to locate a, a collar in that way as a, as a kind of nut, but I could uh, keep things simple and I could um, effectively move the collar to wherever I wanted it. And obviously that's necessary for creating um, uh, for minimizing um, axial play in the mandrel either side of the bearing, but also to locate the, the uh, three-step pulley assembly on the right-hand side. Now, the problem was that uh, it wasn't uh, the proportions, um, the diameter versus the width meant that it didn't necessarily seat squarely. So it was possible to have um, the, the collar um, out of true. Uh, something like this. So that's exactly what happened. Um, I ended up with uh, collars which weren't square. Um, and now that wouldn't have been a problem had it not been for the flatness of the surfaces which I faced with my little tool. So here we see a close up and uh, with one of the collars um, not square, that means that the, the face on the casting needs to be dead square. Um, and uh, because it wasn't, um, it was actually acting like a swash plate and the, the whole uh, um, spindle was moving left and right. Um, hadn't realized that for a long time. I'd used the machine for, for quite a long time and then I, when I started checking uh, with a clock uh, um, facing, I realized that uh, it wasn't true at all. Um, so um, that was something that clearly needed to be sorted out. So to do that, I set up this arrangement. I made this uh, tool. It comprised um, uh, basically a mandrel which sat um, in, in uh, both bearings um, as a good fit. Um, so you can see it located um, at this end. Uh, that's just a, bu a bush there to make up the diameter. So that's a good fit in the, in the bearing. And you can see it fitting on the left hand side. And the third element um, is this uh, sleeve. Um, and the sleeve is a good location on the diameter of the, of the mandrel. So um, the purpose of that is shown in the next, in the next shot. Well, in fact, <laughs> because I didn't have a lathe which could cut faces properly, I had to rough them out and I had to finish them by hand. So a little bit of filing and um, using some brasso to, um, to sort of hone them together and, and get uh, two um, square faces. So I produced two of these and then I used them to um, check the, uh, 
the squareness of the faces that I've machined. So here they are, I, they are in preparation. Um, it took quite a while to do this, but again, this is the problem you face if you don't have uh, access to machining in your in your own workshop. Um, so to get my lathe um, um, able to uh, cut nice square faces is the process I had to go through. So here in operation, you see the setup. So you've got this little jig here, you've got the mandra in place. So we know we've uh, accurately located the center line of the, the bearing. And uh, we now have a, a facing tool which can go up um, against the face of the um, seat that we're trying to check with some marking blue. And that enabled me then to file and scrape that surface to get it square. So that's the way I dealt with it. And um, at the end of this process, uh, I was pleasantly just surprised to see that um, uh, I could now locate work accurately uh, and cut uh, faces reliably. Here is uh, proof of that. Uh, the faceplate for my lathe was um, machined uh, following this and um, I was able to come up with a good result. So this is another example of um, work progressing stage by stage and uh, gradually improving the um, functionality of my machine. So I hope that's your experience too. I hope there's been something here today of interest to you. Uh, any comments, then uh, please do leave them in the uh, section below. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you.